Hi, this is Bart Polson, and in this video, I'm going to cover material from my class, Psychology 1100, Lifespan Development. In this lecture, we're going to look at Chapter 1, What is Lifespan Development? Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about a number of theories of development. The second thing we're going to do is talk about research methods that are frequently used in lifespan development research. So, the first section, the development of the study of development. Now, I should just mention that the scientific inquiry into the human development has existed for a little more than a century. That's about how long psychology as a field has existed. Um, on the other hand, theories about children, about development, and what, how things change over time, those have existed for a long time. So, uh, ancient times, the Middle Ages, children, uh, for instance, in a very different view, were often viewed as innately evil, and discipline was harsh. And um, on the other hand, a modern, more positive view began to develop around the time of the Enlightenment, thanks to the writings of John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Locke, for instance, is the guy who brought us the idea of the tabula rasa, or, or blank slate. And he uh, proposed that children were born without predispositions towards good or evil. Uh, Rousseau, on the other hand, wrote that there was inherent goodness in the child. Now, um, on this, during this time, children tended to work on farms, and they were basically with their families. During the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, though, children uh, often came to cities and they would work in factories, often very long hours in factories, very dangerous conditions, uh, which was probably a step back for children. On the other hand, by being in the cities and around others, they became more visible. Uh, they were employed outside the home, and childhood became to be recognized a distinctive and special time of life, which was not necessarily the case before that. One of the interesting results was that child labor laws were passed and that more protections were created um, and children were encouraged to remain in school, not to get married at extremely young ages, or to be uh, sexually exploited, among other unpleasant things. So that's a very quick review of how things were at, uh, at the beginning. So now let's talk a little bit about the study of adult development. Now, during the 20th century, psychologists began to look at not just children, but across the entire lifespan. Now, this was uh, to include biological and cognitive and social and emotional changes across uh, the entire time from birth to death. And that's one of the things that we're going to be covering. The preliminary chapters that we're going to be looking at are primarily with infants and children, but you'll see that there's tremendous research going on across the entire uh, span of a person's life. Okay, now in theories of development, the very first thing that we want to talk about is good old Sigmund Freud here. Now, uh, Freud, who was originally a neurologist, but developed the field of psychoanalysis, which is a particular form of psychological therapy, uh, his theory was called a psychosexual theory. Um, and he said that uh, development involved the conflict between the expression of basic drives like sex and aggression and how they would conflict with external limits, such as parental expectations, social rules, and so on. Uh, he also proposed three different parts of the personality, which we called the id, which is Latin for it, the ego for I, like I am, and the superego, that which is over I or above me. Um, he also claimed that uh, the id was really the one that people were born with, and it was this really primal, I want everything, I want it right now, very selfish, not concerned with reality or logic. The superego, on the other hand, was really the internalization of punitive voices, uh, often irrational as well. And the ego was the part that people developed. Again, you're born with the id, these other things come later. The ego was the part that developed to reconcile the irrational demands of the id and of the superego with uh, the external world, uh, which is why you have various kinds of psychology that developed from psychoanalysis that are called ego psychology, a way of strengthening uh, the self, the part that has to reconcile all these different forces. Now, Freud also claimed... Uh, about talked about five stages of psychosexual development, the oral, the anal, the phallic, latency, and genital periods, which we'll look at in a second. And he said that like fixations or problems that did not get resolved could occur in each of these stages, and they would result in particular adult problems. So let's take a look at some of these stages. Now, what we have here, by the way, is two sets of stages. The, on the left is uh, Sigmund Freud's stages of psychosexual development. On the right is his uh, one of his protégés, Eric Erickson, and his stages of psychosocial development. Now, I can tell you, because Freud's focus is primarily on young childhood, and Erickson's goes throughout the entire lifespan, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about Erickson across this entire course than we will about Freud. Nevertheless, let me talk about some of these things. 
So Freud says that the very first stage of psychosexual development from birth to one year is the oral stage. And so gratification comes from oral activities such as sucking, eating, swallowing, and that a fixation at this period could lead to the oral traits as like dependence, depression, and gullibility. That's because this is a stage where you're supposed to learn to trust people to administer your basic needs, primarily to get fed because you can't feed yourself. Erickson put a little spin on this one. He called it the, uh, the conflict of trust versus mistrust. And in this particular stage, the developmental task is to come to trust your key care caregivers, primarily the mother, and the environment. Um, the idea here is that you need to learn to rely on others, or really more to the fact other people need to be reliable so you can develop trust on them. Uh, anyhow, the idea is that you can connect with the environment, you can get satisfaction and contentment, and then you can basically lay the foundation for further development. Now, the next step down, from one to three years, Freud called the anal stage, where gratification derives from anal activities, mostly elimination, you know, pooping. And that fixation at this point could lead to the development of either anal retentive traits, you know, excessive neatness, or what's sometimes called anal expulsive traits, sloppiness. And really, it's because being able to control the bowels is a major accomplishment for children, and it's a major task, and there, there's lots of social rewards and expectations about it. Erickson, on the other hand, called this uh, second stage autonomy versus shame and doubt. And the idea here is that you want to be able to make choices and have the self-control to regulate your behavior so the choice is going to be actualized. And again, the, the most obvious um, major thing that a person is learning to control at this point is their bowels. And so it's really just putting a different uh, sense of, instead of just uh, sort of this sort of sensory gratification to the idea of self-regulation and pride. Anyhow. Next one, um, from three to six approximately, Freud called the phallic stage, and the phallus means penis. And the idea here is that gratification comes from the genital region. Now, um, this is where you get the Oedipus complex, where boys are supposed to fall, be sexually attracted uh, to their mothers, and the Electra complex, where girls are supposed to be sexually attracted to their fathers. Um, and the idea is that these things come up, and they get emerged. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, but you could get fixations that lead to the development of phallic traits such as vanity. It's, it's really this attempt to kind of impose yourself on the society around you. Um, also, the phallic stage is defined by the penis. It's not defined by the vagina. It's defined by the presence or absence of this one thing. And so girls are, during this stage are also supposed to feel uh, inferior because they don't have a penis. They have penis envy. But again, even though you can make a lot of this one and it's a bizarre sounding thing, it's not really a central trait to Freud's theories that don't want to dwell on it too much. Now, it's also during this stage that Erickson talks about initiative versus guilt. And he says, right here, what you're trying to do is develop initiatives through planning and attacking onto choice. It's where you're becoming more proactive. And that makes more sense. So when people talk about sort of penis envy or the phallic thing, really what they're talking about is power and about initiative and the ability to do things. And, and that's what Erickson focuses on more. Next stage, 6 to 12 years old, so uh, uh, grade school. Um, Freud called this the latency stage because sexual impulses and sexual gratification were suppressed, um, that they didn't really have this oral or anal or phallic uh, focus on them. And the idea is that this gave the child time to focus on the development of other things like social or technological skills. So be it. Um, Erickson talked about this being the stage of industry versus inferiority, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it in terms of being in the K through 6 period. Uh, the developmental task is to become absorbed in the development and implementation of skills. I mean, again, things like spelling, being able to write cursive, multiplication, knowing your geography, get master the basis of the relevant technology in your time and culture, and become productive in ways that are valued by other people. All right, to continue this, there's a few more stages. Now, Freud really only has one more. Freud's last stage is the genital stage. And the idea is that after the, uh, the latency stage where the uh, sexual uh, focus and, and gratification was really repressed, now you have the reappearance of sexual impulses and gratification. Now, through sexual relations with an adult. Um, anyhow, and that's, what, and that, that's just where Freud just kind of continues from there on. Um, on the other hand, we have Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. We've got several more here because we're only halfway through for him. In adolescence, he talks about identity versus role diffusion, and this is going to be a big one, um, something I, I studied a lot in grad school and I'm looking forward to talking about. 
The developmental task in this period is to associate your skills and social roles with the development of career goals. That's one way. Is, is the what do you want to be when you grow up uh, question. More broadly, the development of identity. And it's the idea of who you are, what you believe in, who you fit in with, how you see the world, how you define what's good, bad. And there's a lot to go on there. Um, then, in young adulthood, where most of you guys as college students are, um, Erickson talks about intimacy versus isolation, where the major task is to commit to another person, to engage in mature sexual love. There's more to it than that, but we'll say more about it when we get to those chapters. After that, middle adulthood, where he's talking about generativity versus stagnation. And the idea here is that you now are able to give back, that you've been nurtured, you've been helped for so long, now it's your opportunity to basically help by having your own kids and, and raising them. Um, at least that's one way to do it. And so generative people are to be creative, they're to give encouragement to uh, younger generation, may include their own children, may include other people, but you're not supposed to be working actively to make you know the world a better place. And then finally, in late adulthood, Erickson talks about ego integrity versus despair. And the uh, developmental task at this point is to achieve wisdom, dignity, in the face of declining social ability, excuse me, physical abilities. And the idea here is that you're looking back on your life. There's not much you can do to change it right now. You're trying, hopefully, it makes sense as to what you've done. It means accepting the time and place in your own life cycle. And we're going to talk more about that at the very end of the semester. The next thing we want to talk about is some of the other theories of development. We want to look at um, some of the work in behaviorism. Now, the one we're going to talk about right here is conditioning. And we're, there's two people in particular we want to talk about here. There's John Watson and B.F. Skinner, that's Burroughs Frederick Skinner, who are both huge names in, uh, well, what you might call the dog training school of psychology, um, where you have the passive conditioning is actually associated with uh, uh, Pavlov and Pavlov's dogs. Um, as well as the uh, operant conditioning. First, we want to look at some of this, um, the conditioning of the Pavlovian kind, where you have, uh, before conditioning, you get uh, bladder tension in a child, and it doesn't make them wake up. They just, you know, pee in their diaper or pee in their bed. And um, On the other hand, you can learn to deal with this by having what's called an unconditioned stimulus. A bell will wake kids up. You don't, they don't have to learn how to wake up. And the idea is that if you pair it, uh, to waking up, that's the unconditioned response, that's the thing that people don't, uh, also they don't have to learn. What you can get is this other thing that says bladder tension, that's the conditioned stimulus. It's, it's similar to the uh, one that they had before, but now they don't even have to have the bell, they've associated enough that now they wake up. And so there's this idea of developing a passive association. On the other hand, we also want to talk about the operant um, approach, and that's in this next one right here. Okay, what you have here is the idea about reward and punishment. Now, John Watson uh, was the first person to argue for a major scientific approach to development that focused almost exclusively, actually I would say exclusively, on observable behavior. He wasn't interested in cognitive processes. He wasn't interested in inferences about emotions and thoughts and motivations. He just wanted to say, what do people actually do? That's why it's called behaviorism, because we're looking at behavior. Um, now, the behaviorist perspective, while it sounds simplistic, was a very big change from what came before, and it, it really kind of swept the academic community at large. Um, it was very, very popular for very many years. Um, and the idea, uh, the behaviorist perspective looks at classical conditioning, the, the Pavlovian bell ringing, and as well as operant uh, conditioning, which we're going to talk about right here. Um, in, in this one, what you can have is an operant conditioning means you do operations that condition or produce a particular response. Now, this is one I talked about in class where you can talk about reinforcement and you can talk about punishment. And the thing here is people often get confused. I want to talk about two different kinds of each. Um, now, you can have what's called positive reinforcement, and that's reward. I'm calling it additive here. I made that term up for this lecture because you're adding something that wasn't there. So if you take something like going to the doctor, which is an unpleasant experience for little kids, but if you give a positive consequence, say you go and get them ice cream afterwards or they get candy at the doctors, that's something they didn't have before. It is added. It's a very pleasant thing. And the result of that is that children are more likely to go to the doctor willingly um, and that that desirable behavior increases. 
Now let's look at the other one, something called negative reinforcement, which actually you could call subtractive. Um, and you can look at something like taking medicine, and you have an aversive stimulus, a uh, noxious stimulus, uh, you got a painful headache. You take the aspirin, that bad thing goes away. And what that does is it makes the behavior of taking aspirin more likely to increase. And so negative reinforcement is a good thing because you're getting rid of something you don't like, and it makes the behavior more likely in the future. Now let's take a look at the other side of this. We can look at um, punishment. And so right here what we have is what you could call positive or additive punishment. And again, additive is the term I made up while I was writing this. Or you can call negative or subtractive punishment. So let's look at the first one. Like a, a child hits their sibling, the aversive stimulus is they get yelled at. That's something that wasn't there before. It's unpleasant. It gets added. Uh, the result of that is that the frequency of the behavior uh, decreases. They become, they become less likely to hit their siblings. The converse of that is negative punishment. Um, again, th these terms aren't used very often. Uh, you can call it subtractive. And the idea here is that something that the kid likes, like having uh, dinner or watching TV, is taken away as a result of the obnoxious behavior. And what that does is it makes the kid less likely to hit their sibling in the future. But that's the basic idea of operant conditioning. And what, that will be coming up again as we go through um, this particular movie. All right. Next, I want to talk about uh, Albert Bandura, who was the really the best-known person behind what's called the socio-cognitive uh, approach um, to uh, development. Now, he uh, still trained in the behaviorist approach, but what he found is that you don't actually have to personally experience the rewards and the punishments to, to learn the behavior. Watson would have said you did. He found that simply watching somebody else and seeing how they were rewarded or punished, meaning how effective the behavior was, that that could be uh, adequate to learn something personally. Again, it sounds obvious, but this was a very big deal when he first came up with it in the 60s. Uh, and the idea here is that you look at people around you, you pattern your behavior after them. Those people are called your models, your role models. Um, now, Bandura is very influential, and he will be coming up a lot more as we go through uh, the course. The next one we want to talk about very briefly is Jean Piaget. And um, Jean Piaget really had a, a fundamental interest in trying to study where people came to believe that something was a necessary true fact. And he ended up looking at developmental psychology. I mean, he initially studied mollusks, but this was something that he came to to try to understand this sort of epistemological question. Now, Piaget, uh, who was huge in developmental psychology, talked about several different things. He, he primarily looked at cognitive development. He was looking at logic, thinking, and problem solving. And he thought about children as budding scientists, little scientists who were exploring the world and making theories and testing them. So there's a few things in particular that uh, Piaget talked about. For instance, he talked about schemes, these mental models that people built up about information. He talked about assimilation and accommodation, where people try to fit new information either into existing categories, that's what that's called assimilation, where you kind of force something into a category even if it doesn't really fit, because you can only have so many mental models. On the other hand, accommodation is where you create new mental categories for new information. Um, Piaget also had a theory about developmental stages. He called them the sensory motor, pre-operational, and concrete and formal operational. And the idea is that children develop from stage to stage. That kid gains more mental accomplishments. They become more cognitively flexible. They're better able to deal with abstract information. And they lose mental limitations such as cognitive rigidity. So, for instance, in the first step in the sensory motor from birth to two years, a, a kid doesn't have uh, language. I and mean, that's why they're called infants. So they, they don't have complex language. And they don't use symbols or mental representations of objects. There's research to back this up. However, What's going on here is they're dealing primarily with their reflexes. Uh, something comes in, they have a reflexive response to it. Um, during this first two years, the reflexive responding and an intentional behavior, meaning something that you're doing with a goal in mind, um, such as making an interesting stimulation last, uh, that begins. It's also that a person gets the basics of language and that that in turn allows them to form the basics of concepts about objects. It's, it's, it's complex stuff. Um, now, in the next few years, which get you into 
uh, two years until you're about second grade is, is the pre-operational years. And again, operation here, by the way, means cognitive operations like, you know, dealing with concepts. And the child begins to represent things mentally, but they are egocentric. Now, what that means is they really only see things from their perspective, can't see it from other people's perspective. And this can be tested literally by asking a kid if they can see, tell you what the table would look like if you sat on the other side, and they, they can't tell you at that point. They only see it the way that they see it. Um, also, they can only focus on one aspect of a situation at a time. So they lack what's called uh, conservation. So if you take, uh, and we've got this little tiny picture here, if you take water from a short, fat glass and you pour it into a tall, skinny glass, they may say that there is now more water because it's taller. They're not taking into consideration the fact that the container is skinnier. So they, they are lacking the conservation of volume because they're focusing on just one dimension, literally one dimension at a time. Also at this time, you get animism, where they think that things are alive, artificialism. And an interesting one is the objective responsibility for wrongdoing. And really what this means is that punishment needs to fit the damage done, regardless of responsibility, regardless of intention. Um, we'll say more about that later. Next, 7 to 12, so the rest of the uh, K through 6 years, you have what are called concrete operations. And this is where logical, mental actions, those are the operations, that's where they begin. And children begin to develop conservation concepts. So if you take some Play-Doh and you squish it flat, they can tell it's still the same amount as if you made it into a different shape. They can better adopt the viewpoint of other people. They can classify objects in series, which means you actually have to be able to see what's in common and what the pattern is, and that's a tricky thing. Also, they can show comprehension of basic relational concepts. One thing being larger, heavier than another, one uh, being faster or slower. Um, and these form the basis of the last thing that uh, Piaget looked at. And again, he wasn't looking at the entire lifespan because he was trying to get an understanding of how people came to deal with abstract conceptual knowledge. And that happens in the formal operational period. That's why it stops there. So from 12 years old, mature adult thought emerges. What this means is that you get deductive logic, so you're, you're puzzling through a sequence of causes and effects. You get the consideration of various possibilities. You can imagine things that didn't happen, try to imagine uh, sort of counterfactual reasoning, see what else could go on. You look at abstract thought and the formation and testing of hypotheses. So that's really um, what Piaget was trying to figure out. And those are the steps. We'll say more about how he actually got there uh, later. Just a couple more theories we're going to look at before we turn to research methods. Next one is Bronfenbrenner's ecological approach, and all I really want to say right here is that according to Yuri Bronfenbrenner, you really need to look at how a person fits within their situation or their circumstances. Um, so you look at the parents, the child and the parents influence each other, but you also look at another other things. You have the microsystem, um, that's the family, the school, uh, other things that people relate to immediately, the peers around them. Then you have sort of a mesosystem, which means in between, um, you get to the exosystem, that's extended family, it's the parents' um, jobs, it's, it's about the government. Then you can get to macro systems, about an entire cultural system. For instance, here in the United States, we have a very strong Protestant work ethic, um, and that's going to influence how people relate to children. Then you get this you know, immense universal chronos system. There are the changes that occur uh, over the life course. Anyhow, we'll talk more about Bronfenbrenner's ecological approach as the course goes on. Um, the last theory I want to talk about, last person I want to talk to about very briefly, though we're still going to talk about research methods, is Lev Vygotsky. Now, by the way, Vygotsky is an interesting one because he did his research a long time ago. I want to say back in the 30s, but it was it was in Russia and it was basically on lockdown, and people in the West didn't discover his stuff till decades later. Um, I want to say the 70s or 80s. It took forever. Um, anyhow, Vygotsky's approach was a sociocultural one, and he looked at social interactions between children and adults, mostly in the home, and he saw how those interactions organized a person's experiences so they could obtain cognitive skills such as computation or reading, and use them to acquire information. Now, there's a couple of major ideas associated with uh, Vygotsky. The most uh, well-known is what he called the Zone of Proximal Development, it's, it's ZPD. It's a, it's a complicated term. The zone, of proximal, the zone of Proximal Development refers to the range of things 
that a kid can do, not on their own, but with the help of someone else. When they're in this social situation, you know, you can do things that you can't do otherwise. It's like how the same way that athletes often perform better when people are watching or when they're playing against somebody who's good. Um, a child can do things when they are with other people that they can't do on their own, and that's the social realm there. Um, also, they, this works best when they're with somebody who is more skilled at the particular thing. That's called scaffolding. So you kind of build up around, and you can build on what that person has until the child acquires that, and you go on from there. We'll say more about Vygotsky as the uh, semester goes on. I um, want to talk about just a very brief reference to some of the controversies in development. Now, for instance, you can talk about uh, the, the eternal nature versus nurture, where you try to look at how much is due to things like biological influences and heredity, and how much is due to environmental influences, and it gets at a lot of things, and sometimes the debates get really ugly. I will let you know that sometimes it's very difficult to separate the two of them, and so you have to be careful about what you do, but this sort of stuff does come up, obviously. Uh, the second one is whether development is a continuous sort of flowing process where you get gradual learning, that's called the continuity perspective, or they have a series of rapid steps, qualitative changes, called the discontinuity perspective. Um, now, a stage theory, like we had with Freud or Erickson or Piaget, those ones are discontinuous theories. They assume there's going to be these jumps that go on. But there are other ways of approaching it. Uh, the last one is about how active or passive are children. So historical views of children, they saw them as, uh, where they saw kids as willful, unruly, and obviously needing punishment, saw children as very active beings, that they were choosing to be this way. Um, on the other hand, uh, John Locke, who saw, you know, kids as a blank slate, he disagreed and said that children were passive beings being acted on by their instructors and their environment, and so that places a lot more of the responsibility uh, on their parents, on their families, and the people around them. Now, that is the first part of Chapter 1. We've, we've covered some basic theories, a little bit of history. We still need to talk about research methods, but I'm going to do that in the next film. See you there.